use three fingers. I'll put it together anyway. Fine. And there we are there. Great. Okay, well, uh, we are here for the last talk of today, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce John Cleary. Now, um, John Cleary uh, teaches languages. Uh, he's in the language department, rather, at the university, a university in Scotland, namely the Harry Harriet Watt, Watt yeah. University yeah. in Scotland, and has previously taught in colleges and universities in Germany, Japan, Malaysia, the UK. He's been involved in educational development projects on teaching modern European languages for some time, and that has led him to travel widely in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And in a previous life, he also worked in a museum yeah. and wrote a history of the people who had built and inhabited medieval almshouses. Now, today, John is going to talk us, uh, to us about how you can use your Y-DNA over and above just getting the results and looking at your matches. So he's going to talk to us about a variety of different types of projects you can join, like surname projects, geographic projects, haplogroup projects, and heritage projects. And uh, his particular heritage project that he's working on is of great interest to me personally as well. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you John Cleary. Well, thank you very much, Morris, and uh, thank you all for coming to listen to me today. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, just check. I'll just turn you off. Make oh, sure. I'll turn you on. There we go. Thank you. And, uh, oh, yes, yeah, I can hear him myself now. And um, I'd like to say I've heard some very interesting talks today, uh, um, and in particular, I'm, I'm devastated to learn that uh, my surname, Cleary, or, or Cleary, is not the oldest. Uh, surname in Europe, which I believed it was, and I've had my illusions shattered uh, today, but uh, it's, it's always good to learn new things. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, going to talk about surnames today, though. Not, not from the perspective of uh, surname research, but how to put together a, a surname project. And I'm going to talk, as Morris said first, about um, projects, how you can use uh, the various types of projects to enhance Y-DNA testing results. And I'm going to specifically talk about Y-DNA, so I'm not going to touch on mitochondrial DNA or on um, family finder tests today. And then I'll talk about a particular example, which is a surname project which I've been involved in, which is this surname here, Kemp, um, which, as I said in my um, blurb post online, is a very good Irish name. Um, and I think it's a, as good as any other Irish name, for reasons I'll, I'll explain as, as we go on. It doesn't have any 17th century genealogies, however it is uh, a name very much linked to the, uh, the farmers of uh, Carvin, which we heard about earlier as well. So, um, um, th this, this talk is going to be aimed really at um, people who have done wide DNA testing, and would like to learn more about how these projects organise themselves, what they can offer to you, um, and um, how to enhance value from results, from test results that you've got. If you haven't done Y-DNA testing yet, you may find this of interest to help you think about what it may offer you. And of course, some of you I know will be very experienced administrators and will know uh, the basics already, but I hope you'll gain something from my discussion of the surname project when I come on to that later. So... Um, as Morris said, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm brief about the four types of projects, but I will give examples of one surname project and one heritage project. I'm a co-administrator of the surname project here, uh, which is run by a colleague of mine, uh, Andrew Kemp, in Australia. And I'll talk about the uh, Scottish Dunbar Prisoners project, which I am and the, the administrator of. So, um, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with Y chromosome testing, but I'll whiz very, very quickly through what it's all about, just in case anybody is new to this. As you know, the, the Y chromosome is one of the uh, 46 chromosomes, and it's this little fella here, right, this stubby little fella right at the end, um, which has only really one major function, which is to make you a man. If you have one, you're, you're a man, although... I think not, not always in 100% of cases, but let, let's not go there. However, um, the Y chromosome is passed on from father to son in a direct line uh, all the way down generations, changing slightly here and there as it goes, which makes it uh, a very, very ideal tool for tracking the spread of surnames. Again, the Y chromosome and surnames will not always go hand in hand in ways that do make interesting findings of people who take tests. Uh, many of us will have discovered that we're not descended from the people we thought we were. I certainly did, and many other, others of you also have found that, probably. Um, 
So here is the, the direct male uh, descent, and of course it's uh, clear that it can only tell us about one line of our ancestors and says very little about all the others. So I'll give the usual caveat when I'm talking here about uh, who is related to whom I am talking about specifically in this direct male line. Um, so, of course, we can be related to people through other lines, which are equally valid and equally important, but today I'm focusing on that, um, that direct male uh, line that carries a surname. And the, um, the markers we're talking about, again, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but just very briefly, uh, the markers we're talking about are points on the Y chromosome, which, um, in the case of the STR markers, the ones commonly used for surname studies, are repeating patterns that repeat themselves a certain number of times at a point on the Y chromosome, and all these marker labels are the names of these repeating patterns. And when you find yourself looking at your results, you'll, you'll get something like this if you test it with family tree DNA, in which all these positions on the Y chromosome are listed, and the numbers of the repeating patterns are then given, and these are your results. And of course, as most of you will know, these numbers of repeating patterns can change slightly as we go down the generations, and these are the changes that we're interested in. So if uh, here, this happens to be my results, I have 12 here on this marker. If somebody else has 11, then we have a genetic distance of 1, because we have one point of dis difference between us. And so again, I'll be talking about genetic distance later on, and that's essentially all it means. So um, the project I'm going to talk about then, um, I'm going to talk about four types of projects. The most common one that most people will be familiar with are the surname projects. These are the ones in which uh, people who have the same surname, usually, will join and will compare their results to see if they are related and if their uh, surname stems from one or a small number of common ancestors at some stage in the past. Um, then, of course, there are the... Haplogroup projects, which again I'll be talking about, and the surname project I will give as an example, is developing as an interaction at the moment between a surname project and a haplogroup project. I think these are very important. They are often thought to track deep ancestry and migration patterns, and they do very well, but they're increasingly becoming, I think, really important as the science of DNA testing evolves uh, for people who are researching surnames and genealogy as well. And we're finding that uh, the people I should be looking at are in the uh, haplogroup R1A, which is not the most common one in Ireland, as many of you will know. Um, and R1A came out of Eastern Europe uh, thousands of years in the past, but uh, we're now finding that some of the markers we're finding in our group are taking us into the genealogical period, period and are helping us to answer genealogical questions. Um, it's also true that the administrators of the uh, successful and active haplogroup projects are generally great experts on uh, their haplogroup and on the process of DNA testing and can give some of the best advice about how to proceed with further testing. So I always recommend people to join a haplogroup project as well as a surname project. There are geographical projects. I'm a co-administrator of the Scottish DNA project. Um, and the last one I'm going to look at will be what I call the Heritage Project. I think it's a good label, and there are fewer of these. I think it's a newer type of project, but it's something that I think is developing and will be very interesting, I think, for people researching not just genealogy, but other kinds of local um, and community history in the future. So to take us through these, then, um, this is a quick summary of the, the four types. And I'm going to begin by whizzing through some of these. Haplogroup Project, then, as I said, is... Um, originally looking at the patterns of DNA within one haplogroup. The haplogroups being these deep ancestral uh, descendancy cl clusters of people who descend from somebody who had a single mutation thousands of years ago, which are still identifiable as being passed down to their, their modern descendants. Um, and many of these occurred in the prehistoric period when uh, the human uh, race was spread much more thinly across the planet, and therefore some of these become defining of people's movements and migrations across um, Africa, uh, Asia, Europe, and into, into the Americas. Um, but as I suggested, however, these haplogroup projects are also offering people who are researching more recent genealogy uh, a lot these days. Um, this is our um, surname project um, 
for Kemp, visible in the R1A um, haplogroup project, where it's been linked with a number of other surnames, which I'll be talking about in the course of, of the, the talk. And uh, the R1A project, I think, is I think it's actually one of the best going because the administrators have been very active and dedicated and, and quick to analyse new results as they're coming through. And they've been continually extending the descendancy tree of R1A uh, right from the top down to a number of um, subclades, the subgroups, um, which are coming much more uh, recent in time. This has taken us down to round about zero, the year zero um, AD. And so they're, tra they're tracking particular RNA patterns through Europe, Scandinavia, Eastern Europe. And um, they're now also pushing all of these forward in time um, to ways that are very, very useful for people who are tracking their own family history. Geographical projects are a little bit different. They, they tend to be very large, as do surname projects. And I have to say, at the moment, I am wondering in many ways what... Uh, we offer that's different in the Scottish DNA project, what's different from the haplogroup projects, but there are, there are some specific functions. For example, it helps to profile the DNA patterns of a nation or a region or a county, and this may be useful if you want to um, find out where a migration began from. Many people are doing DNA because they want to find out where their ancestors came from across the Atlantic or uh, where they originated from in the old world. And therefore, having an understanding of the localised patterns of DNA can help people to track down where their ancestors may have originated from. I'm working with somebody at the moment who is looking at a particular pattern that looks Scottish, but the ancestors he knows about are Welsh and from Norfolk and from nowhere near Scotland. But however, the signature he's looking at is Scottish, and so he's, he's working on how this may be explained. And again, the, the local patterns of Scottish DNA can be, can be useful there for him. Also, many people are strays. Um, there are people who do DNA testing and find they haven't got very many matches. I'm one. I did um, DNA testing up to 111 markers, and I have no matches at all, at any level, uh, except one at 25. Uh, in actual fact, I do really, because the 1 at 25 does match me at 111 at about 15 or 16. So not really very close, but close enough to give us something of, of, of interest. But when, when I looked at my DNA results at first, it was a rather lonely experience. I thought, surely the universe is more populated than that. But luckily, um, the, 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 big the, the big geographical projects do help people who are in that situation to find people who are not closely matched to them, but still may be matching them at a wider range. And again, it gives some clues to them. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Heritage Project, and this is some which we're developing, um, which we began this year, and therefore it's still in a very, very early stage, and we're going to hopefully uh, talk more about this over, over the coming years as we begin to extend it. But we're, we're look, I'm looking at and working with um, some people who are interested in the consequences of the Battle of Dunbar in Scotland in the year 1650. Now, I think there's been a bit of a trend at the moment or a fashion for uh, battle uh, projects to develop, people who want to know where they descended from the survivors of Bannockburn, for example, obviously a major Scottish event which is commemorated this year, as we just had the 700th anniversary of it. Um, and the, this is very, very similar for very particular reasons. Uh, Dunbar is not a very widely known battle. It's not talked about very much in Scotland for the uh, simple reason that the Scots lost this battle. Um, and they shouldn't have. It was a classic case of snatching... Uh, uh, defeat from the jaws of victory because they had Cromwell's invading army surrounded and Cromwell was on the verge, well, actually began a desperate breakout uh, attempt because he believed he was defeated and somehow turned it round and the Scottish army was defeated heavily. But what we're interested in isn't so much the, the battle itself and who was there, we're actually more interested in the, com the, the aftermath. A bit of details here, Dunbar is in East Lothian, it's on the east coast of Scotland and uh, Cromwell's army in the summer of 1650 tramped up and down um, the, the East Coast to Edinburgh and back several times, uh, and the Scots refused, very wisely, refused to engage them in battle until they made a mistake and finally did it. Um, and so here we have plans of... Uh, the Red Army here is the, uh, the English army, which is boxed in in the town of Dunbar, and the Scots had a, a perfect uh, view of the English army from a hilltop, and, and instead of besieging Cromwell, as they should have done, they came down from the, the mountain and found themselves trapped between the, the, the river here and the mountain and became sitting ducks, unfortunately. But what we're really interested in 
is uh, are the consequences of uh, what happened next, because uh, it's believed about 10,000 Scots were taken prisoner um, in the battle, and about half of these died, uh, sorry, half of these were released, rather, because they were um, wounded, sick, or, and probably dying, and therefore no threat to the English army. The other half were marched, route marched, from out of Scotland into Durham. And again, this was a, a major breach of um, contemporary mores of warfare, because uh, the English army was invading army, and they were marching their prisoners out of the country that they were invading into their own country. And Cromwell did, did this for very, very pragmatic reasons. He wanted to make sure that these Scots would not reform into another army and threaten him. But the consequence was that the vast majority of these prisoners did die en route. Uh, some of them died of sickness as they went. Others died of um, the flux, which is probably dysentery, uh, in Durham Cathedral, where they were incarcerated. And about a month later, only about a 1,000 of these uh, 5,000 prisoners were still alive. Some of them made escapes, but only about 1,000 were still alive and fit. And um, these were ordered to be transported to the colonies. Um, now, some of these may have been barbadoed, <coughs> the same way that many Irish prisoners uh, of Cromwell and, uh, and, and the um, Restoration period were. Um, some of them may have gone to Virginia, again, to work as indentured labourers. Um, some were definitely sent to the European wars as mercenaries, um, some were sent to Ireland uh, to fight for the, the English troops in Ireland, um, although not the Highlanders. There was a specific ban on sending any Highlanders to Ireland because, of course, they spoke the same language and might change sides. Um, but it's not actually known uh, how many, if any, of these orders were actually uh, followed up. There's, there's no records to know whether any of the prisoners uh, were sent to Barbados or Virginia. Some probably were, um, but the um, colonies in America, Virginia and Maryland, in particular, were actually also in revolt at the same time because they, they were supporting the, the royalist side. And therefore, um, it was deemed to be a risk to send these, the, by, by the parliament to send these prisoners to uh, those colonies. And they were held back until the local revolts were put down. But we definitely know that 150 of these prisoners were transported to New England um, in uh, the, the winter of 1650. And a year later, a further um, 300 or so of these Scots prisoners from the Battle of Worcester at this time, when the Royalist army received its final defeat by the Parliamentary army, were also transported to New England. And these were then indentured as labourers, as, as servants in the colonies, and worked for seven years as indentured servants, many of them then settled in, in, the, in the area. So I'm in touch with many people who are descendants, or believe descendants, of these uh, prisoners who are interested in finding out more about the story itself, how they came to be there, how do they settle in the American colonies, um, how many of them made it in the sense of being able to find people to, to live with, to settle with, to marry. Obviously, obviously many of them did raise children, many, many others probably didn't. I've got to say that these um, prisoners in New England were probably the fortunate ones because they were transported to a place that was uh, a, 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 a similar Protestant kind of society. I know there are big differences between the English and the Scots Protestants, but they're, they're similar in, in outlook. And therefore, maybe these prisoners were easily able to settle in and perhaps they survived their indentures. Whereas many of the ones who would have gone to uh, Virginia or Barbados, as with many of the transported Irish prisoners sent to the, the same places, would probably have died during the course of their indenture. Anyway, this is something which we're working on and we're using DNA for a part of this. We're also um, looking for as many uh, contemporary records as we can at the time to try and ascertain the full story as full as possible. And uh, this is the beginning of our DNA bit of the project, <coughs> at least. And so here we have a number of people who've already fingered themselves as descendants of um, the, the prisoners. And you recognise some very Scottish names here. We have Hamilton, Dunbar, Colquhoun, Bow, Moody, McCall, Grant, um, and the um, believed direct male descendants of these prisoners have tested already, and we're building a collection of um, DNA. I'm not going to say much more about this other than say this is something which is ongoing and we're working on it, and I hope in the next uh, couple of years to talk more about it um, as, as this develops. So the main thing that we're going to talk about today then really is um, the DNA surname project, which I think most of you will be familiar with if you've done your own DNA testing. As in a sense, if you test and you don't put your results into any project or any, any means of comparing your results with anybody else, there's not much point in doing it. So the DNA surname projects give the best opportunity 
for uh, comparing results with others. Um, this is the uh, Kemp and Camp project. Um, there is some evidence that Kemp and Camp are uh, cognate surnames, in, in some cases at least, and definitely in Cavan, which I think is probably down to the, the Cavan accent, uh, where if they say Camp or Camp, people can't necessarily tell which is which one the same. But anyway, um, having said that, the Cavan Kemps are Kemp, I believe, not, not Camp. But um, this, is, this is a good example of one of the kind of um, surname projects we heard about earlier, in which there's clearly no common ancestor. There's no Mr. Kemp who um, sired all the Kemps of, uh, of, the, of the current world. And in fact, many of our lineages are very, very small. I've got a few bigger ones higher up. I'm not showing you the R1A uh, lineages are quite big. Um, but these are some of the lineages which have emerged. Obviously, these have only got two apiece. And down here, we have a lot of people who've tested and don't actually appear to match anybody with, with the, the surname Camp or Camp. Um, and I think it's a small project. We only have about 100 members. We do need to try and um, bring more in before we can really uh, say that these people will not find surname matches. But at the moment, it looks like a very varied, multi-origin surname. And the project is helping to reveal this. Um, if you have tested and you're not sure about what to do next, I would urge you to join as many projects as you think are relevant to you. I would say that everybody join a surname project of your surname. Jo try and join the surname projects of people who you match closely with different surnames because there may be a relevant connection there. Um, join a Hapler Group project and take, take advice from the administrators on how they read your DNA, join a geographical project because that helps to contribute to profiling DNA in a region and of course look out for any heritage projects which may be of interest to you. But join as many as you possibly can, they're free to join and there's no limit on how many you do sign up to. So I'm going to talk then about um, the surname project which uh, I've been involved in. I've got to say I've only been involved in gene genealogy for about two and a half years. I was persuaded by um, a, a friend in Scotland uh, to test against my better judgment. I imagine I'd learn nothing interesting by doing so and how wrong I was and that's what leads me to be here today. And um, as well as testing my own name, Cleary, getting not very far because it turns out my ancestry may well not be Cleary. Um, but I'm going to talk about that today. I've also been testing my maternal line. Um, my mother's uh, maiden name was Kemp. And this is Kemp from Ireland. Uh, Kemp is not a very common surname in Ireland, but it's also an interesting surname in the way it appears and is, and is distributed. So um, I've got to say, by the way, this, the, the slide I have here are a bit of a how to do a surname project. So if you're familiar with this, um, apologies in advance, but I use this in a, a different talk and I was talking about how you could. Um, set up a small scale surname project. Um, I'll skip through this one actually. And uh, these are the, the processes which I went through uh, when I began to investigate the Kemp. So, Kevin, I was aware of the Kemp surname project at the time, and there were no uh, Irish Kemps in there at the time. So, I began to look for some and recruit some. And I can tell you that one of them is sitting in this room today, but I'm not allowed to tell you where he is. But I can say that thank you very much. Well, wherever you are, because your DNA helped to spark uh, a very uh, interesting set of, of discoveries which are still going on. So, um, so basically, the, the procedure here then would, would be to begin by researching your name of interest. I've got to say here, after we heard a very interesting talk about how we can really delve into the very deep past of surnames in Ireland, I, I, don't, I haven't been doing that to that sort of degree, but I do think it's useful for people who are setting the project to investigate the distribution and more recent history of, of their surname. Um, and then, of course, work through finding your uh, candidates, uh, approaching them, persuading, cajoling them to test, um, organising the finance, because we, we all know that DNA testing uh, doesn't come free. And, and then, of course, deciding what we're looking for in the results as they come in. And finally, one that's often overlooked, to get back to the genealogy because... Genetic genealogy doesn't work unless it's done hand in hand with genealogy. So, to go with the, the first stage then, investigating the, the surname, the name Kemp is an interesting name, I think. It's not a especially rare name in um, Great Britain, although it is a, a fairly rare name in Ireland. But in Great Britain, it does have this very interesting double distribution. And I cannot say with any confidence whether we can term it an English name 
or a Scottish name. Um, it may well be a name of separate origins in both countries, or there may well be some shared origins perhaps through Norman ancestry, perhaps through something to do with the East Coast here. But we see there's a very um, wide distribution in, in East Anglia and the southeast of England, um, and a very wide distribution again in eastern Scotland. Um, and surname dictionaries generally suggest that it's an East Anglian name coming from Ang Anglo-Saxon campa, meaning champion uh, or warrior. And that's certainly what Rainey, uh, in his Dictionary of English Surnames, suggests. Um, he has uh, citations <laughs> from the Middle Ages. Um, I've got to say, this one here looks rather Norman to me, but maybe I'm just misreading the, the look there, and maybe that's also a really Saxon name. Um, and in Scotland, Black's um, Surnames of Scotland gives a slightly different uh, origin, suggesting that it may actually be Old Norse in, in origin, and suggests that the name Kempty is very, wi very widely found in, in Aberdeenshire, and this may reduce to Kemp uh, as well, as names often tend to change unpredictably and come together. So two possible suggestions here. It may, it may well be, of course, that in Scotland um, it was a name carried in by English settlers. Um, certainly in Orkney it's very common, and the Orcadians believe it's a name there of English origin, not, not a Scottish origin. So in Ireland then it's much rarer, and it's limited to really three or four major pockets. And um, one of these is Cavan, the one that I've been looking at. Another major pocket is in Cork, at the city, city of Cork and County Cork here. Um, and there are also camps found in Limerick. It is a, appears to be a Limerick name. Um, and there are camps in, in Dublin. And, and the, the camps in Dublin tra trace back a long time. They were there in the, the Middle Ages. So it's been tracked in Dublin uh, at least back to the 15th century. Uh, possibly English traders. They often seem to be mariners. So possibly English traders trading and bringing ships into Dublin. Um, and so this gives a very... Um, uh, immediate set of questions, because one of the questions could be, are these three pockets, obviously, is, are each of the people related to each other within the pockets, and are, is each pocket then also related to each other? In other words, do we have a common origin for the name in Ireland, or do we again have multiple origins for the name in Ireland? So Kemps and Cork carried out their own uh, DNA study some years ago, about 2007. In fact, they wrote to me, because um, they knew that I was researching the history of the Kemp family, in about 2009, and asked me if I'd test DNA, and I scoffed, oh, of course, I'm not doing that, what do I want to do that for? Um, but they went ahead and did their study, they found five testees, um, tested them to 37 markers, which at the time was uh, a very uh, suitable number, and they indeed found they matched very closely, this is their uh, results, and you can just about see almost all the 37 markers here, and you see there are only, this is the colorized markers result page, and there's only three differences in all five. Now, five isn't very many, but these branches are all very, very different. They were spread across uh, Britain, Australia, Ireland, and the USA. The English tester, he was one of these, apparently believed he was actually East European Jewish, and had a bit of a surprise to find that really he was Irish. Um, but all these branches who didn't know that they were related beforehand um, came out as being quite closely related, and therefore um, they went back and did, did more genealogy and found a very plausible... Uh, person to be their most recent common ancestor, who married in Cork in 1686. And so they did a very, very neat study. What was interesting for us was it meant that immediately we had something to compare against. And as soon as the, the first uh, result came in, uh, we could ask whether the Cavan Kemp's were also connected uh, to the, the Cork Kemp family. Now, do note here that although um, family tree DNA have changed the way they display <coughs> haplogroups, um, these people are all R1b which, as you know, is the, um, the most common form of, of, of Y-DNA in, in Ireland. Well, were the Cork and Cavan Kemp's related? It didn't take very long to get a very clear answer that no, they're not. Not for at least 20,000 years, because the Cavan Kemp's turned out to be R1A, and therefore a completely different family. So it was the first discovery we made, um, and it also meant we had a fairly distinctive <coughs> DNA pattern here, um, to compare with f further Cavan Kemp tests as we went along. Um, I've got to say, of course, the usual caveats, there could be relationships between these people in, in, in other lines. Um, it's quite common, of course, for gentry family um, to pass on a female surname if this means land 
remains in a certain line. However, I don't think the um, the, the Cavenkamp's family, at least as far as I'm aware, I don't think they're ever uh, qualified as gentry. Um, likewise, there could be an NPE, the, the famous non-paternal event, but I think for various reasons I've gone along with this, I'm sure that's not the case. I don't, it didn't seem plausible that these two lines can be connected. So we have got two quite separate Kemp families in Ireland. Now, I know nothing at all about the Limerick Kemp's, and I'd like to. And I also know there are Kemp's in Dublin who may have been there for much longer than either of these two. So again, the, this, you know, this doesn't capture all of the history of the surname in Ireland, but I think these are the two major family groupings that take us a long way to understanding this. So, going back to surname dictionaries, um, Edwin MacLeisa um, commented on the uh, origin, not so much of the name Kemp, but the name Campbell. Uh, I, don't, I don't think he has Kemp in his uh, surnames of Ireland. Um, but on Campbell, he said, it's um, a Scottish name. It's also the name of an Irish sept in Tyrone. It's uh, found in, in Donegal for Scottish Galloglass. And down here, he commented, through the little comments, he just threw away at the end, the name has even been abbreviated to Camp and even Kemp in County Cavan. Now, I do not know where MacLeisa got that from. Um, sorry? Enchanting as our own, I believe. I, I think you did. And I, I did speak to the Chief Herald of Ireland about this a couple of years ago, and that's more or less what she said, though I think she probably put it a bit more, more politely. Um, but uh, yes, indeed. Um, there doesn't seem to be any uh, documentary evidence that backs this up. Uh, in actual fact, I don't think he's totally wrong either, because I think there may be something in the origin of this name that may be connected with that Cam sound. I'll come back to that later. But I don't think um, the Camps are an abbreviated form of Campbell. So I think that doesn't seem likely. Although it could well be that we may well be looking at some kind of gap. <laughs> My God, what was that? <laughs> Did I do that? <laughs> yeah, something exploded. We're also here, are we? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> at that moment, I should move on. Um, so, the next stage, then, we've got to find out our testees. And um, ideally, we're looking for people who are at least um, third cousins from each other, if not further, and who have a good genealogical paper trail to take us back to the kind of period where we can begin to piece together a shared relationship if we do, in fact, find one. I've got to say that some of my testees match this. They had um, reasonable um, paper trails back to the 18th century, which isn't bad for Ireland on the whole. Um, others, um, particularly those who were descended from migrants to the Americas, tend to know how, they, how far they got back to the late 19th century and then it would peter out. But we did actually manage to help one of these um, go a few generations further back through the DNA results which he uh, found. So, this is a little scheme I've got of the, the way in which the, um, the DNA study developed. And these are all the various lines which I was able to pinpoint. It's very small, but it's not necessary to see the, um, the, the names written here. Essentially, each of these is a genealogical line of a uh, family of Kemp's from Cavan. Uh, over here we have a number of people, families who are in Kilachandra Parish. Over here we have some families who are closer to Cavan Town. And here we have um, a family that I've tracked through older records that stops. I can't track it any further forward, um, but it's plausible they could be connected to another family line here, which again is in a central part of Cavan, and definitely appear to be uh, well settled in the sense they have the largest farm of all these families, and they seem to be fairly static. They've been there for a long time, close to the, the main town, so I theorise these may well be the oldest, um, Kemp's and Cavan. Sadly, there are no male descendants uh, in this line. That, that, that's gone. But all the others um, have managed to track uh, male descendants. And we have lines here with people now living in America, in Australia, in Ireland, in Germany, um, and in Scotland. Um, and many of them were very keen indeed uh, to um, give their DNA. And at least four of them were Irish, which means that we do have a representative number of people from Ireland to show that this is actually an Irish surname um, and Irish DNA pattern which we're looking at. So what I'm aiming to do is try and link these together somehow. I'm not expecting to be able to push them further back in terms of finding names, but I want to know whether it's plausible that I can draw lines here that show how they may branch and how they may connect. And um, here then are the results. This are the results on the results page. Um, and um, I'm pretty satisfied that what we began to find was all of these uh, shared a very similar DNA pattern. 
and these are the um, the um, earliest known ancestors for each line we're able to identify from various townlands in County Cavan. And just take a note of, of that name very briefly. I'll come back to that a bit later. Yeah. So this is the distribution then of the um, earliest known ancestors. Again, here's a little cluster around just north of Cavan Town. That's Cavan here. Um, this is the line that's died out, which did seem to be, uh, as I said, on the largest farm closest to Cavan Town, and actually also <coughs> closest to the, the Farnham Estates, which might well be where the uh, ancestors of these people first came into the county. And down here we've got a couple in Kilachandra, and there are more families in Kilachandra I haven't yet managed to track, but I'm trying to. <coughs> and what I haven't done yet, I'm aware of another group of families up here around Coot Hill. Um, which is a little bit further away from the others, but again, they, they've gone, I can't find any descendants of these, but I think there may be some in Canada, and I'm trying to um, track these down to extend the scope of the study and see if they're uh, related to. And um, what I've noticed is that there seems to be a spread out from the parish of Kilmore, and so the Farnham Estates in the 17th and 18th centuries would have been largely in uh, Kilmore and um, Anagelif <coughs> parishes around the town of Cavan, and it seems if we have people spreading out this way and spreading out this way, so this looks a plausible possible centre for where the, if there was a common ancestor where they came from, and it's fortunate indeed that the oldest surviving parish records in Cavan are also from Kilmore, so we have something to check there. So we decided to go for um, largely six to seven marker tests. Uh, initially we did a lot of 12 marker tests and then upgraded them as we were able to raise finance to cover the tests. And uh, most of our group have now gone to six to seven markers. We decided not to go over 111 because we feel we learned enough uh, from the six to seven markers and we began to look at um, SNP testing instead. Again, I'll say more of that later. Um, and uh, again, I'm not really giving a talk about how to do DNA projects here, but um, I think it's always worth considering when we're setting out on these things, how to persuade people to take part. Most of the people I approached were very enthusiastic, I'm glad to say, and very interested in finding out what, what we're trying to discover. Um, I was turned down by only two people, um, who both represent one line, they're two brothers, and they're in Australia, and I think it wasn't me who approached them actually, I think it may be that they didn't quite understand what we're asking, why we're asking them to spit into a jug and gives it a DNA sample. So I'm going to try them again at some stage, but they are quite important. But most of the people I approached were very, very um, keen to take part, weren't particularly worried about the privacy um, aspects. Of course, they are very, very important. Um, again, I'm sure all of you know this, um, DNA testing is not only for men at all. In fact, the more I find myself involved in this, the more I find that most people who are running um, why DNA samples seem to be women researching genealogy who've recruited male um, relatives to donate the, 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 the test samples. So it's very much um, a way to explore surnames, and it's not just for one gender, it's for anybody who wishes to investigate uh, this area. So uh, on to the results. So here's our results screen again, and we did believe that we identified a lineage. We believe that all of the Kemp's of Cavan are related related through the direct mail line uh, with a, a common ancestor at some stage um, back maybe between roughly 1700 and going back to about 1300. Now the obvious um, timing for, the, for a name like this and for a common ancestor with that kind of name you would think would be at the time of the plantation. It does look like a Scots name and these were a Protestant people of a Church of Ireland, most of them, and therefore it's plausible to think that they could have come in the plantation. But I began to find that actually some of the um, genetic distances I was getting were rather wider than the, the ones identified in the Cork Kemp study, and it, which got me rather worried um, about making an assumption that these would be plantation settlers. Um, for example, I've got one line here, which is a Canadian uh, tester, and who, who only matches some of the others in the group at 8 out of 67, which is quite a wide um, distance there, um, and would not be considered by family tree DNA to be a match, in fact. That's why it's coloured pink. Um, others, of course, are very, very close to each other. We've got some twos out of 67 here, um, we've got a five there. So there's a lot more variability here than there is in the, the Cork Kemp study. And I suppose there's two ways of looking at this. This might simply reflect uh, random variation. 
So it may well be that the Cork Kent descendants didn't change very much, and, and ours did, and that's all there is to it. Um, and they may still be of a similar period. On the other hand, maybe this degree of variability <coughs> is suggesting that this might be an older um, cluster, in the sense that the most recent common ancestor could be further back in time. Now, I don't think I can base anything um, on this, um, except just simply bear that in mind as a possibility. And therefore, uh, I wouldn't say this, this proves anything, it doesn't prove that these are not plantation settlers, but it does um, raise a question in me as to whether they could be, and actually whether this is a, uh, a DNA pattern which um, appeared much earlier in Ireland. Uh, one way to test this is to look for similar DNA patterns elsewhere. And if there were plantation settlers, the most likely, most likely place of origin will be Scotland. Um, I'm yet to find anything uh, remotely similar to this DNA pattern in Scotland, whereas I have found more people who are quite similar to us in, in Ireland. I'll come on to this shortly. Um, so going back to my little scheme then of my, of my nine lines. I had nine lines, by the way, um, including the one here in the middle that has become... Um, extinct in the male line, although I believe there are still descendants of that line. Um, but the, these are the uh, remaining eight lines then with known male line descendants today, and I believe that we can connect them in this kind of way. So I think we've traced three um, major subgroups of this, and uh, I think these red lines, the sort of red lines here, are ones that I feel fairly confident about saying these are related and relatively recently. We're probably looking at an 18th century um, common ancestor for each of these clusters, um, but each of them are also similar enough to each other to show that s at some stage there's a common ancestor back here. And maybe, just maybe, it's pointing towards the uh, original Kents I found living in Kilmore um, at the end of the, of the 17th century, or maybe the uh, common ancestor will prove to be further back. But at least what we've learned from this is that there is something to investigate here. And what we need to do is to go back and do more of the genealogy to see if we can find evidence that sheds more light on how uh, and when uh, these groups may be related. Um, we promised all to make this too technical, but this is a slightly more complex version of, of the chart, again showing the, the three clusters. Um, so this is the one based around um, Cavan Town, which is one that eventually leads to me. Um, this is one um, based around Kilachandra. And this one is the Canadian line. The moment I have only one testee from this line, and this is the one that was showing the widest genetic distances from all the others. And so at the moment, I can't tie this one to either of the two groups. It's a group on its own. And, and it's possible that, of course, if there, there will be a common ancestor of this and the others. It's quite possible, of course, that common ancestor could be even further back in time and may even called something else, but somehow both lines began to use the surname Kemp, and, and that can't be discounted. Um, and these are, these are showing the, the key STR markers uh, for these people. This is the, uh, the shared pattern for all, th all three, well, for these two, rather, for these two. And these are the key um, mutations which are marking each of these lines. So, as I, su I suggested, the, the final stage um, in this Actually, it's a cycle pro process to go back to the genealogy and look for more paper evidence. And so now we have a possible theory that we may be looking for a, a common ancestor living maybe in the late 16th, early 17th centuries. We can go back and look and see if we can find any sign of him. As I mentioned, um, Kilmore then has the oldest records in Cavan, church records in Cavan, and seems to be the place where the, this family first appears, if only because that's where the oldest records are. And um, if I look at the, um, the uh, marriages register for Kilmore, on the very first page down here we find 1702, uh, James Gray marries um, Jane Kemp. That's the first entry in, in the register for the, the Kilmore marriages. And um, three years later, Jane's sister, well, I assume it's Jane's sister, uh, Sarah, also marries in 1705. I can assume, probably assume they're sisters. Unfortunately, the register doesn't give the name of their father, um, of, of, of either parent, but if we had the name of the father, we'd have a candidate for our most recent common ancestor. So we can surmise that these two sisters were probably born around 1680, and the father, therefore, born between 1630 and 1655, um, and therefore we can pinpoint, pinpoint the generation 
where this family may have arrived in Cavan. Um, there are lists, quite, quite good, good lists of uh, soldiers mustered in Cavan in the early plantation in the 1620s, and there are no camps on there. So it does seem to be a reasonable uh, supposition that they arrived after the end of the Confederates' war in the 1650s. So we could see someone being granted land, maybe as a reward for what he did for the winning side in the uh, Confederate and Civil Wars, and that could be a time when the, the camps arrive, maybe as um, privileged or protected um, tenants of the, the Farnhams uh, in, in Cavan. Interestingly, there is um, um, a will in the National Archives, which is one of the few surviving 17th century wills of a man named Nicholas Kempston. And uh, Kempston was a Cromwellian general. He was one of the inquisitors of the 1641 uh, 1641 de depositions, and he was also a Quaker, and Kempston was given land in Cavan, and he also used the land, he awarded the land to uh, Irish Quakers to protect them uh, when the Quakers were facing persecution. Now, I don't believe, I don't believe a minute Kempston will be the person looking for, but it could well be that someone under Kempston's protection may be, um, that there could be a connection there. Unfortunately, I can't see the will. I went into the National Archives in April, had a look at it, and they came up to me and said, oh, sorry, we, 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 we've lost it. <laughs> it's in there somewhere. We don't, just don't know where it is. So I'm hoping that they're able to find it at some stage, um, because it is one of the, obviously, a very rare thing. Uh, a 17th century surviving wheel in Ireland is a very rare thing, so hopefully they'll find that for us at some stage. Um, yeah, so this is a little summary there of, of what I was saying about Jane Kemp being the, the first identifiable person in his family in Cavan. So where did the Kemp's come from before they were Irish? Well, they're going to be on the last day of the talk now, very briefly, to talk about where we're leading, where it's going. Uh, we don't really know, but I have a little clue here uh, about where I think the, the Kemp's did come from um, before they were Irish. I'm not convinced they were Scots. Um, they, they may have been, but I think there's evidence here that we... I think we're covering evidence here of possibly a surname of Scandinavian origin uh, linking with several other surnames of Scandinavian origin, which may be um, of, of Irish origin itself. So, uh, I mentioned in early 2013 we found um, a match with a man whose, whose, answer, whose surname was different, but told us that his ancestors were called Kempton. Now, I assumed immediately this was probably going to be a mistake of some kind, because um, you know, maybe the names changed, uh, maybe uh, the ton was added um, as, as his ancestor moved, moved around Ireland. But in actual fact, there is a um, Kempton series of families, or set of families, in Tyrone and Derry. And they're settled along the Ballanderry River um, and farming on both the Derry and Tyrone sides of, uh, of the river. And they're about as large as the Kemp's of Cavan. There are, in the Griffith survey, you can see about um, seven or eight of these families, about the same number, roughly, as there are of the Kemp's. So these do seem to be quite independent families. Uh, it's always possible, of course, that someone may have moved between the two. We haven't uh, tested any more Kemptons yet. It does look as if we're finding a family with a similar name and a similar DNA profile, again, something to investigate here, which is suggesting that we're not just looking at one single point of origin, one single most recent common ancestor, but maybe something more complex. And going beyond that, um, the matches of many of the people in our group uh, are showing, again, very regular patterns and some very familiar, very similar surnames are appearing in each of these. There are men named Cummings or Cummins are regularly coming up as matches for people all the way across our group. And whenever they know that... Most of these are actually American, one English, most American. Whenever they know their point of origin in the old world, it is always Northern Ireland. And Tyrone seems to be the place that they are they're leading to. We found an extended family called Jacobs. And these are all, all in America. They're all descendants of one man with good, good paper trails, tracking back to an indentured servant named John Jacob who settled in Virginia by 1665. And other names appeared, such as Anderson, Small, Adams, Gibson, Bennett, and Taylor. All great Irish names, of course. Um, but the probable exception of Jacobs, these are, are all quite common names in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland. And you may say they're of British origin, I think that they probably are mostly, but again, I can't be sure whether any of these are 
largely Scottish names in origin or English names in origin. They're all found in both Scotland and England, and therefore I'm still not seeing any really strong signal as to whether this group of people, assuming they're all related, came to Northern Ireland from either Scotland or, or England. So we're still not really clear on that. Um, we've come up with um, a um, acronym for this group because we have... I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to lower the tone here, I'm afraid. We have Jacobs, Anderson, Cummings, Kemp, Kempton... And small, so we have the Jacks. Um, I'm, I must apologise at this stage. I did not come up with this acronym myself. Um, this was um, thought by one of our American um, uh, co-researchers. And when I explained uh, the connotations of the Jacks in Ireland, he thought it was hilarious. So we are now the Jacks group, uh, officially. Even though there are other, other surnames, we have Bennett and Taylor that don't fit quite so well into, into the acronym. Um, but... We're getting some patterns here. They, whenever the place of origin is known, it is always Ulster. Many of the, many of the members don't know where their ancestors came from if they left uh, Ireland. But when they do, it's always pointing to Ulster. Um, I have not been able to find signs, really, of this in either Scotland or England. Not close enough to confidently feel that uh, we're finding um, a shared origin. Um, there is... I've come recently something matching this pattern <coughs> called Connell... Um, has, has uh, approached me and she believes her ancestor came from the Isle of Bute in um, Scotland. That could be the first sign of a Scottish connection, but equally um, she believes that her ancestor may be an Irish um, emigrant into Bute, so that's not really taking us further forward. But um, we identify this group because they're all R1A. They're all in the subgroup of R1A called L448, if you're familiar with the SNPs. Um, this is the defining marker of the so-called Young Scandinavian group. And all of them have this very distinctive marker, DYS447, as an STR marker, with a value of 21. And this is very rare. It's, it's rare generally across uh, most haplogroups. And in R1A, it's only found in 1% or less of R1A testes. So when we're finding all these uh, factors together, plus one or two other fairly rare markers, we can be pretty sure we're finding a signature of, of common descent. And because uh, the more people we add to this, the, the more variability we get in the group as a whole, the more we're needing to push back the likely dates of the most recent common ancestor. And because all of these seem to be associated with Ireland, it's looking more and more likely that whoever that most recent common ancestor is... Um, he will have been someone either, either in Ireland or whose descendants moved to Ireland, leaving none behind in Scotland or, or England or wherever. So back to the, um, the, the R1A chart. Um, as I said, this is in um, R1A. We have down here the Northwestern, Northwest European flavour of R1A. And here is L448, which is often known as the Young Scandinavian um, subclade. Uh, this is a marker called CTS4179. If you're bamboozled by these numbers, don't worry about them. They're essentially just catalogue numbers for known mutations. But these are defining mutations of, uh, of groups that have been analysed further. So this one is associated with Scotland. So this is a, a Scottish, largely Scottish line. But we are finding the Kemps and the others are coming into this line here, uh, YP355. And this year we've been doing some testing um, with the, the YSEC company on specific individual SNPs. Um, these are new SNPs which have been discovered this year and are leading us to refine further how the, the JAX group might relate to this overall group. So looking more closely at the... Um, yeah, there, that's the Scandinavian subclade. Looking more closely at this... Just blowing it up for you so you can see it more clearly... And uh, I have to thank the, the R1A project for this excellent chart, which they keep up to date as they discover new markers. So this is, this is the YP355, which we discovered just this year, is parallel to the Scots um, CTS4179, and the, the jacks are down here somewhere. Well, we're here, actually, but in between, of course, are lots of other mutations which we are discovering at the moment. Um, can we be sure that the jacks are um, definitely a coherent subclade, uh, given the um, distinctive markers which they have? And this is a, a tree which I ran a few months ago using a software package called Philip, 
or Philip, not quite sure, um, using the R1A uh, modal results as the root and running through all the jacks to see what kind of patterns they throw up. There's only the 6 or 7 marker testes, but we can see here, this is the, the Jacobs, and most of the Jacobs are coming off a single branch, which is, which is coherent with the, their known single ancestor. These here are the, the Kemp's, these are the Cavan Kemp's here, again coming off a single branch, quite close to the Jacobs, uh, on this data anyway. This is the, the Cavan Kemp that's going off on a different line, possibly further away from the others. And here we see the Cummins. And what's interesting about the Cummins is they're showing much more variability uh, between themselves and with all the others than we and the, the Jacobs groups are, possibly maybe indicating that we may have a more recent common ancestor of our subtrees, whereas the Cummins perhaps stretch further back in time. Now, I'm mindful of what MacLeisa said about the origin of the Kemp name, um, attributing it to a corruption of Campbell. Maybe it's a corruption of Cummings. And perhaps that might be the, the ultimate origin. Maybe that's what we're looking for. Again, very much spe speculation, but this is leading in a certain direction. And while I wouldn't, again, put too much weight on this tree, there's a lot of data not included in this, um, I, am sort of, I am caught by the, the range of variability. And the Cummins lines generally don't know each other. They're not people who are able to easily get in touch with their third, fourth cousins because they've dispersed quite widely. So their um, common ancestor is indeed likely to be a lot further back in time. And maybe, just maybe, will be the common ancestor of all of us. I'm going to do my time. Almost time to finish. So this is the chat. Come back to the R1A project. We've got this far because the R1A administrators have been helping us greatly, recommending SNPs to tests and keeping us up to date with um, new SNPs that have been discovered. And two people, a Cummins and a Taylor, have already done the, the big Y test. And we have the results that are just coming through in the past two weeks. And the R1A people have already updated their charts to show new um, SNP descendancy lines here. Um, and we were planning to do a Kemp Big Y test um, fairly soon, at the next sale, in fact. But I thought I heard some today say that the Big Y is no more. You know, I'll find out more about that later. Oh, no, there's an extra one. Oh, there's an extra one. So the Big Y continues. Okay. It continues, but there's a deep played R ah. being introduced. Which would be additional to the Big Y. Additional yes. to the Big Y, just focusing on the or haplogroups. Ah, right. Which would include us, of course, since we're an or haplogroup. Yeah. Okay, so um, <coughs> this is the way it's shaping up. Um, the, here's the young Scandinavian, that's the one we tested earlier this year, and the, the Cummins Big Y has identified that there are two, new, two more SNPs which they knew about and thought were only Scandinavian, or large Scandinavian, and they've popped up in our line as well. <coughs> and we can be pretty sure that all the Jacks will have these, um, uh, at least the R1A administrators are. And we know that within the Jacks group there is a division because we've tested for uh, a recent SNP, uh, again discovered this year, called PF4661. Again, don't worry about that alphabet soup. It's just a SNP that it turns out the Cummins and the Taylors have, and the Kemp's don't have. And we believe, although they haven't tested it yet, they're trying to, the Jacobs and the Smalls also will not have. So we have a division here. And what this means is we're now moving. I've got some dates here showing the, the approximate ages of these SNPs. We're now moving into... A genealogical time. So this SNP here, without doubt, will be within uh, what we may call genealogical time, or the time when surnames were commonly used. It was often thought to be about 1300. I've used the conventional English date here, but I think as we heard from Kathy Swift's talk earlier, that more or less holds for Ireland too, I think. Um, and so PF4661 is a division in the Jacks group. Uh, without doubt, since then. So we're now seeing how the haplogroup projects are discovering um, information which is useful, very, very useful indeed, to genealogical research. And they're going to assist the two big white testers with analysing their results further to uncover more mutations between here and here. And we know there are some more that Cummings and Taylor have that they, that they don't share. So there are more that one has but not the other, which are suggesting that they will also uh, distinguish a branch within here, and we want <laughs> at some stage to test some of these here to see what we, we can find here. So these are now becoming markers of great relevance to people who are doing family history research rather than looking at ancient 
uh, migration, migratory patterns. I'd like to finish by saying that, of course, there are many, many good books on the subject, and you've just been hearing from from Emily um, Oliciano and her excellent book on how to do um, DNA research, and these are two books, Debbie Kennett's um, Surnames Handbook and um, The Surnames DNA Family History by Redmond's uh, King and David Hay, which I found very, very useful when I started to help me uh, work out how to approach researching a surname and how DNA can help, what DNA can do and what DNA can't do, so I very much recommend uh, these. The last thing I would say really is all that I've given you is very much a work in progress. Um, we are discovering new things as we go. Fat, yes, uh, I was going to show. Yes, I can try and make this Macintosh thing work. <laughs> Which way to slide it? Yeah. Got a complete uh, technological numpty here. Um, I received this email today from um, Mr. Cummings, which I shouldn't show his name, should I? But never mind, you, you see, you've seen it now, uh, about his um, big Y. And uh, he told me that that um, yes, he's talking about the matches he has and his big Y, and he's telling me the surnames that he's matching with um, Taylor, who we know that's part of our group, but also a range of other names here. Some of them uh, I'm going to use this thing now because I know it behave better. Some of them are definitely Scandinavian names: Matson, Hedberg, Beckervolt. Uh, Australian, we're seeing a lot of Scandinavian names here, and whenever we, we find close matches that are not Northern Irish, they're almost always Norwegian and Swedish. A couple more Northern Irish branches here, or there's an Orr family from Northern Ireland who are not. Um, if I go back to my, oh god, I'll get that. sorry, Morris. <laughs> Yes, I'll go. In fact, what I'll do is I'll just I'll go very back to my chart, which is at the very at the very end, isn't it? Yes. In the end, that one, yeah. This one. Um, great. There we go. If you go back to my chart. We know that the um, the Oars uh, and the Northern Irish family, Tuckers, an English family, uh, are coming down this line parallel to where we are, um, but not. Very closely related, um, and as you see, many of the other names. Henderson is a, a, a Scottish name, I do believe, but a Scottish family rather. But the others, again, are very much um, Scandinavian. So it does seem that whenever we see um, close connections to our DNA pattern, they're Scandinavian, not Scottish or British. Now, of course, it could be that there are Scots and English who haven't tested yet, um, and we'll find out more of this as we go along. But I think we're looking at something that it seems to be an Irish. Um, lineage here, a set of surnames which are, which are not necessarily Irish in origin, but it looks to me as if the people who bear those surnames uh, may have been in Ireland for a very, very long time indeed. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> and if anyone's got any questions, I'd be glad to answer any time for questions. No, absolutely, yes. Yeah, we have one question down here with Patrick. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, a, a marvellous uh, presentation, and I leave that to Morris. Um, there are camps in Limerick. Yeah. Uh, I've been there for, uh, in 1974, 75, 85, 86, mm -hmm. and I'm aware of the name, and I'll help you in any way I can. Thank you. I also know that there are theories in Limerick, both C L E A R Y and C L E R Y. <coughs> but the Commons, uh, currently there's Senator Commons mm -hmm. uh, in the Upper House, and he's also the leader of the Senate. Uh, sorry? Uh, I just said about Commons, C U M M I N S. Uh, Senator Commons is the leader of the Upper House mm -hmm. at the moment, and you could certainly mention my name oh. uh, to him. I've been in the Senate for 12 years, right. and we'd be delighted to help you. Thank you. Uh, you're obviously applying great uh, in ingenuity and vision and everything, or bigger, may I say, but, uh, in relation to the camp. Our uh, the Commons and as I say the theory we'd be delighted to help. Thank you very much for that yeah um, I haven't uh, investigated didn't, didn't talk about the Cleary line very much I found that my uh, I, I do have a very firm paper trail back to the 18th century but my closest matches are called Gorman so at some stage some things happen but I'm not quite sure what yeah. but so uh, thanks for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, on the genographic project mm -hmm. it was held in May I did test over 100 people and the results showed our O and B uh, and to do about 88 percent they attribute to Gaelic, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I too they attribute to Mesolithic region, mm -hmm. and um, uh, O and A, the five percent they attribute to Viking. Mm -hmm. Right, 
And I think most of the RNA in Ireland tends to be attributed um, uh, to biking. So I think your conclusions are probably correct. Uh, the, the second thing, Cleary is a very interesting name. Hmm. You know, Mike Cleary, uh, the author of the Annals of Ireland, yeah. uh, one of the affiliate families. And mm -hmm. we're, we're seeing circumstantial evidence that many of these, like the McFurbish, McEgans, and so on and so forth, are somehow related. Mm -hmm. So that, that, would be an, uh, that would be an interesting project to do at some stage. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it will be. I think that there's actually, actually an O'Cleary uh, project, which I'm, I'm, I'm a member of, and again, it's a very modal origin name, it would appear. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Cathy. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that was the point I was just going to make. Clerach yeah. is, is simply the Irish word for a churchman. Yes. So it's, it's a profession name, and, and, and it's extremely common. So it's very unlikely you'll get a, a, a very strong connection between the various O'Clearys. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you'll probably get a lot of connections between Clearys and Clarks. Yes. Which is the, the, the English equivalent. Yes, indeed. Yes. Thank you. Do you have anybody from Spando Ballet in your Kemp project? Gary Kemp and Steve Kemp? I've thought about that. There's also uh, Ross Kemp, the, uh, the former East Enders actor. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should send letters off to all the celebrities with a name we're studying and saying we'd like to donate a DNA test, please. Absolutely. <laughs> anybody yeah. else has that have any questions? Yes, we have one here. Thanks. It's just related to something you mentioned um, about why DNA strays. Mm -hmm. I've had a male relative test as well, and there have only been two matches, and they're at a distance, a genetic distance of seven, mm -hmm. despite having a very common surname, which is Murphy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just wondering, in view of the, the surname projects, is there anywhere to go with it? Is there anything more to do? I think you should definitely join your surname project. And yeah, I've if, done that. Yeah, yeah. Do you, if you presume the matches are, are also called Murphy, are they? That you, no, no, they're not. Oh, no, something else. Completely different, meaning nothing at all. And I have, you know, reasonable records back to the on that line back mm -hmm. to the late seventeen hundreds. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so, I think similar position to my uh, my own Cleary line. I didn't go into any detail about this, but my my main match is called Gorman. and um, there are several Gormans I match to. No Clearys at all. So that would appear to be. Um, where we're looking, and I do have a, a very firm genealogy paper trail back to someone who lived, who was born about 1760. However, I, I know that one of the people in that line uh, lived next door, was actually a tenant of a man called David O'Gorman in Tipperary in the middle 19th century, so I think there's a little smoking gun there. Yeah, and, and you may find something similar yourself. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. the surname seems to be mm. from a different part of the world altogether, but... Um well, that's, that's not exciting, actually. I, I really want to investigate how that came about in that case. Maybe she travelled. <laughs> yes. It's not too unusual. I have an O'Carroll that doesn't have any matches of 37, and you'd think that a name like O'Carroll would have lots of, of matches. But And even with it's a, in the Orwin B. Hapler group, it is not uncommon to find somebody who is Orwin B. that has absolutely no matches because they're very distant from everybody else. So, Any other questions? We have a question here at the back. Yes. I noticed on your presentation page you had the name Dowling. Was there any particular reason for that? As yes, the, the, the little word I began with. Um, if I can... Oh, no. Um, oh, I know. I know. I can do, do this. You wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't believe I actually learned to use computers on Macs, would you? And then became a PC user and uh, forgot how to use Macs. There we go. Um, okay. The, um, this, this wordle is of my ancestry. So these are the surnames in my direct ancestral lines going back. So my uh, grandmother was born Dowling in Kildare. And so, yeah. yes, that is my family line, mother's line also. Well, we, we, where, where from? Um, they would have been from Mead, from Dublin and Mead, and they would have also had cousins who married for quite, you know... We have a little chat. Uh, not not from Ballybarney, are they? Great grandparents, so, you know, <laughs> they're a very strong Dowling connection. We have, have a little chat at the end in that case, yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Any, any, any more questions? Any other questions at all? One question here? Yeah. Um, would you recommend joining uh, surname groups for people that you match in, uh, say, at uh, the 67 level? I certainly would. I mean, I think a lot often it depends on the particular attitudes of the administrators. And I'm a member of the Gorman Project, 
the, for the Gorman administrator chased me down before I even, even responded to him, found him, and he, he signed me up to his project straight away. Other surname administrators tend to want to limit their project to that particular surname. It's a choice they make, really, so it depends on their, on their policy. But um, certainly I would write to um, administrators of surnames that I would then match and approach them to see whether they'd accept you as a member and then just discuss it with them. But yes, I would in general, because I think, I, I think what we're looking at here are the genetic um, descent lines and the surnames change as you go down for various reasons. And therefore, I, I think limiting a project to only one surname can actually miss a lot of very interesting information. Yeah. Was there a particular reason why you chose to go with the 67 that marked the test rather than the 111? It was uh, financial, it was cost. It was trying to spread what we had around um, the largest number of people while also getting the best information. And uh, we actually did a couple of 67s initially. We then did several 12s to see if those people matched on the first 12. And then when they did, we expanded them up. Uh, we actually had one um, camp um, who lives in Dublin who didn't match on the 12, and we haven't followed him up, but actually I think he's got a very interesting story as well, because it turns out his ancestor was uh, an English Coast Guard who joined the Navy, then came to Ireland and worked on the ships um, as a Coast Guard on, on the West Coast and settled and uh, has got several descendants now in, in, in Ireland. But because we're looking at the Cavern um, uh, family in particular, we, we expanded anybody who was a 12 up to a 37, and then again to 67 in most cases. But I feel that um, we're not going to learn much more from doing 111s. We've got enough to show that it's a very, very distinct group. I know that some of, um, I know that some of the, um, the uh, Cummins have done 111, and we could do that at some stage, but I think there's, at the moment, no real need to. Snips seem more, more interesting. I'm getting a head, a head, a throat-cutting sign from the right, back. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, well, Henry. Thank you, Liz. Let me just yeah. thank John Cleary one last time and say, John, fabulous, fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. Oops. Let's try not to do that. Did it in a video? Thanks very much. Cheers, Maurice. Yeah. Fantastic. Absolutely great. Yeah. Let me turn off the um, uh, recorder. There we go. Yeah.